So humans first began consuming foods made of wheat about 12,000 years ago, and that is on a widespread, purposeful basis. There was very rare occasions of sporadic consumption prior to that, but systematic widespread consumption began around 12,000 years ago. That was consumption of the einkorn form of wheat, which is a 14 chromosome form of wheat. It's the wild growing uh, form of wheat that grew naturally in the Fertile Crescent, eras that are now Israel and Syria and places like that. How did humans consume it? Well, it's not easy because if you saw einkorn, just like modern grasses, it's a grass. And you can't eat the stalk, you can't eat the leaves, you can't eat the roots, you can't eat the seed uh, without taking the husk off, drying it, dehydrating it, and then pulverizing it, which they did with, with uh, stones. They pulverized the seeds, and then they had to add water and heat it. So it took a lot of manipulations in order to, to consume this, and they consumed it first as porridge. So many thousands of years later, the Egyptians, clever people, learned how to ferment uh, a, 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 a grains as beer, and then use the beer to make leavened bread. And that happened several thousand years ago. But what did humans consume prior to consuming grains? Well, for the preceding 2.5 million years, we ate the, uh, uh, the flesh and uh, organs of animals, their fat. Uh, we'd gnaw on their bones and eat their bone marrow. We'd spear fish and get shellfish and gather berries and other fruit when seasonally available. We'd dig in the dirt for roots and tubers. And we'd eat other things, like even insects in some parts of the world. We ate what was available. But then there was a period of global climate change, a natural uh, phenomenon 12,000 years ago that led to an increase in temperature and dryness. And that's why people were prompted, when they were hungry and desperate, to look to the seeds of grasses such as einkorn, uh, for, for an alternative source of food. Now, what happened to those early humans 12,000 years ago who turned to wheat? This is also true for the people in sub-Saharan Africa who turned to millet. Um, it's also true of the people in Central America, Mesoamerica, who turned to teosint and maize, the forerunners of corn. And to a lesser degree, the peoples of Southeast Asia, the swamps of Southeast Asia, when they turn to rice. These are all forms of grasses, seeds of grasses. When people turn to the seeds of grasses for sustenance, they did indeed get some calories, and they developed explosive tooth decay. Interestingly, prior to the consumption of grains, tooth decay was uncommon. One to three percent of all teeth recovered showed evidence for tooth decay or abscess formation or tooth loss or misalignment. So people died, even in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, with full mouths of teeth, uh, missing very few, if any. And they were perfectly aligned and intact. When we added grains, tooth decay exploded. 16 to 49 percent of all teeth recovered showed tooth decay, abscess formation, misalignment, etc. Now, the absence of tooth decay prior to grain consumption is remarkable. Think of it. There's, there was no toothpaste, no dental floss, no fluoridated water or fluoridated dental uh, or, or fluoridated toothpaste, no dentists, no, ortho, no um, uh, orthodontists, yet there was very little tooth decay, which makes sense, right? If you live wild and you have to gnaw on your food, some of it uncooked, you need a full set of healthy teeth to do that. And having a mouth half of, of, of lost or decayed teeth, it's hard to survive. But that's what happened when we added grains. There was also an explosion of doubling of bone diseases like arthritis in the knees. This is clearly evidenced in, in the bone record. There was an increase in deficiencies such as iron deficiency. You can see the evidence for iron deficiency in the bones is called parotic, parotic hyperostosis and crypto orbitalis. These are, uh, uh, show that the, uh, uh, there's insufficient iron being absorbed. And that's because the phytates of grains block iron absorption. And that's just a sample of the health changes incurred by early humans who turned to even einkorn wheat, the ancestral form of wheat. Now, grasses have a peculiar capacity, unlike humans. So you have 46 chromosomes. Uh, if you partner with somebody and have a child, that person contributes 46 chromosomes, and your offspring doesn't have 92 chromosomes, right? They have 46 chromosomes, just like you and your partner. Grasses don't always follow that rule. 
So einkorn mated with another wild grass, because einkorn was a wild grass, and this other wild grass contributed 14 chromosomes, and that was the origin of emmer wheat. Emmer wheat is the wheat that was largely used in the Bible, in biblical times, and pre-biblical times, and in that period of time. So when you hear talk of bread and wheat in the Bible, it's usually emmer wheat, sometimes einkorn. Well, emmer wheat also mated with another wild grass, because emmer is a wild grass too, and that yielded the forerunner, the predecessor of modern wheat, the triticum species, or what the agricultural scientists call tri triticum cultivars. And uh, humans grew that because it made better bread, it was a little more hardy in growth, a little more higher yield, and that was manipulated over many years to select sp uh, strains that were had uh, better baking properties, etc. But it was not that much change until 1960, and that's when agricultural scientists and agribusiness got into the act, and they changed wheat even more. They took this 42-chromosome plant and manipulated it extensively. For instance, farmers and scientists selected strains that had higher phytate content and higher wheat germ agglutinin content. Well, phytates uh, uh, were selected because they're they're pest resistant. They're pesticides, in effect. They resist molds and rusts and fungi. Likewise, wheat germagglutinin, a strain selected for higher wheat germagglutinin content. Well, the phytates are very powerful binders of minerals in your gastrointestinal tract. So it binds about 90% of the, of the iron in your diet. It binds the calcium and magnesium and zinc and causes deficiencies. And the wheat germagglutinin is highly toxic, even in minor quantities, even in milligram or even microgram quantities. It's a very potent uh, gastrointestinal toxin, and the little bit that gets absorbed into the bloodstream, and it does, because many people have antibodies to wheat germagglutinin, is highly inflammatory. It adds to body inflammation. So modern strains of wheat have been enriched in phytate and wheat germagglutinin content because agribusiness saw it as uh, helpful to fight off pests, but it also heightened the toxicity of modern wheat strains. And then agribusiness did other things to change the plant, such as use the methods of chemical mutagenesis. They use toxic chemicals to induce mutations in wheat seeds and embryos. Chemicals such as sodium azide. So that's a very toxic industrial compound. There have been some instances of accidental human ingestion of sodium azide. The poison control people tell you that if you witness somebody accidentally ingesting this compound, do not give them CPR. Because if you do, you'll probably die. And if, they, if the victim vomits, don't, put the, don't pour the vomit down the sink because it may explode. And that has actually happened in real life. So this toxic compound, sodium azide, is used to induce mutations. That's how herbicide-resistant strains of wheat were created. Now, this all predated genetic modification, that is, the use of genetic splicing to introduce new genes. Ironically, well, I'm no supporter of genetic modification. I think it's a terrible technology. Genetic modification is actually an improvement over the older methods, such as chemical mutagenesis, because chemical mutagenesis introduces dozens, if not more, mutations and unpredictable effects. But the wheat that was sold to you, has been sold to you, that does not, has not been subjected to genetic modification, gene splicing, is the product of those older methods, those older, very imprecise, very harmful methods. What all those efforts did was they took the toxicity of uh, traditional wheat and worsened them. So they increased phytate content, wheat germagglutinin content. They did not increase the gliadin protein content that's within gluten. They changed the gliadin structure. There's about 200 or more forms of gliadin, and most of them are new, and they're much more toxic than they used to be. And gliadin protein is now responsible for inflammation, gliadin drive opiate peptides, have mind effects like appetite stimulation, and provocation of uh, behavioral outbursts in kids with ADHD and autistic spectrum disorder, and provocation of, of hearing voices, auditory hallucinations in people with paranoid schizophrenia, and provocation of addictive eating behavior in people who are prone to bulimia and binge eating disorder. So those are all been, those effects have all been amplified by the efforts of agribusiness. Now, in modern times, we're told that modern, that wheat products, right, should dominate every meal and snack. In fact, the USDA and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services would like to see us use wheat and other grains as the basis for 70% of all human calories. You can appreciate that 
making this thing that never belonged to the diet in the first place was added in a moment of desperation 12,000 years ago and extracted a health price and now comes to dominate human uh, uh, calories, that advice is plain awful. And it's a big part of the reason why we have the world's worst epidemics of type 2 diabetes and obesity and autoimmune diseases and inflammation, etc. But understand this, these issues. Understand how wheat worked into the history of the human diet and that wheat was added only 0.4% uh, ago of our time on earth. In other words, humans did not consume the seeds of grasses like wheat for the first 99.6% of our time on earth. Accept that, put it to work, eliminate this mistake we made 12,000 years ago and the bigger mistakes we made in the more recent past with agribusiness, uh, the manipulations of agribusiness and the and the blundering of official dietary advice. Understand all this in the context of human history, eliminate it, and you are empowered to take back control over an astounding amount of your health.